I want to talk about April Fool's Day, which is five days away at this point in time, but just happens to be my birthday. So it's an important day to me, and I'd like to talk to you not about April Fool's, not about my birthday, but about fools in general. And here's what the scripture has to say about fools. First, from the book of Proverbs, the wisdom of Solomon, uh, chapter 12, verses 15 and 16. The way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. And then from Ecclesiastes, or the preacher, uh, chapter 10, verses 12 through 15. Words from the mouth of the wise are gracious, but fools are consumed by their own lips. At the beginning, their words are folly. At the end, they are wicked madness, and fools multiply words. No one knows what is coming. Who can tell someone else what will happen after them? The, to the toil of fools wearies them. They do not know the way to town. And then from the gospel, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as recorded by Luke, chapter 12, verses 16 through 20. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store up my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Well, again, my birthday is a day of foolishness. April 1st. I didn't have any control over it. My mama decided to deliver me on that date. But you know, ever since I was a child, uh, being born on April Fool's Day means you get a lot of jokes, a lot of pranks, a lot of strange things happening to you as a result of your birthday. I'll tell you one particular time that I think I was 15 years of age and school was uh, it was a school day for my birthday on a Wednesday, I think. And after school, a friend of mine named Mark invited me to go down to his house and go down in the basement where he had a pool table. And I played there with him before. So I thought we were going to play pool. So I went to Mark's house, headed down the steps. Someone flipped on the lights and yelled, Surprise! And there were maybe 40, 50 of my friends gathered there and they all said, surprise. And then they went home. That was it. No more, no less. End of story. Well, since that time, I've learned how to turn the tables on that sort of foolishness. And I've become a jokester myself. If God hadn't called me into the ministry, I don't know, maybe I'd have wound up in Los Angeles doing some kind of stand-up routine. But uh, I claim the foolishness, but I claim it as a fool for Jesus. I don't mind being called a fool as long as I'm witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because his foolishness is ultimately the wisdom of the ages. And speaking of wisdom... Let's talk about the Bible and its wisdom and its foolishness. Proverbs 12. The way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. Well, there are two ways to approach knowledge. You can be open to new knowledge, or you can close your mind and say, 
I know what I know, that's all I want to know, and I'm not interested in what you have to say or anyone else because I've got enough. I don't know. It seems a little strange to me. I recall some years ago when I became pastor of the Highland United Methodist Church in Odessa, Texas. I'd only been there a few days and a fella came to me whose name was Phil and he said, Preacher, I want to tell you what you need to preach about and what you don't need to preach about at this church. I said, okay, Phil, tell me. Well, I listened for about an hour to Phil's raving and ranting. And when he wound down even just a little, I said, Phil, thank you for sharing all that with me. It's been good to know you, and I don't think I'll be seeing you again. And he said, well, preacher, it's my way or the highway. I said, good, then you take the highway. And that was my response. You see, we need to be open to hearing that which agrees with us and that which maybe challenges us and causes us to think a little more differently, a little more deeply. And uh, we might learn something along the way. Fools have closed minds. And then the scripture says, fools show their annoyance, but the prudent overlook an insult. You know, I learned a long time ago, I'm nearly 75 years of age, I'll be 75 on April 1st. Sometimes the battle isn't worth fighting. Some things are just too small to get involved with and uh, kind of have to overlook and pick your fights. Pick something that's significant. Some folks are always ready for a fight. Every issue, every problem, every concern, they make their concern. I used to have a friend down in El Paso, Texas, another Methodist preacher, his name was Don Forsman. And I remember one time when Texas was considering legalizing the game of bingo, which is kind of a semi-gambling game. Um, they went to Don Forsman and a reporter shoved a microphone in his face and said, Pastor, what do you think about legalizing bingo? And Don responded, I think we have bigger fish to fry. In other words, that's not worth getting involved in. And you know, Christians sometimes get involved in causes and issues that are too small, really. Let's focus on the big thing. Um, the death, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is important. Whether or not um, people buy lottery tickets, eh, I can let that one go. Don't always tilt at every windmill. Let some things pass. And then from Ecclesiastes 10, words from the mouth of the wise are gracious, but fools are consumed by their own lips. At the beginning, their words are folly. At the end, they are wicked madness, and fools multiply words. Have you ever run into folks who just like to talk? They talk and talk and talk and talk and you keep waiting for them to at least breathe between sentences. But uh, sometimes it's more important to speak a few words, a few words of perhaps significance than a lot of meaningless drivel. And so the wise choose their words and they choose them carefully. The fools just keep on talking all the time. Um, and then there's the idea here in the second part of this passage. No one knows what is coming. Who can tell what some who can tell someone else what will happen after them? The toil of fools wearies them. They do not know the way to town. Billy Graham used to tell a story 
back in the early days of his ministry. He was just getting started preaching revivals in little towns all over North Carolina. And uh, one particular little town he was in, he was unfamiliar there. And so he was walking around the downtown getting ready to mail a letter that he'd written. And he saw a young man and said, sir, where's the post office? And the young man said, well, it's over there to the right down two blocks. And Billy Graham said, thanks. And then he added, by the way, uh, I'm here for uh, preaching the gospel and I'd like a chance to show you the way to heaven. And the young man responded, how are you gonna show me the way to heaven? You don't even know the way to the post office. Well, there are folks out there who are clueless in their scheming and planning. They think they know it all and uh, they've got it all figured out and designed and planned and so forth and so on. Some of us, I think, may be a little wiser. We just simply trust God's design. Whatever God has planned, we're ready for it. Today is the Sunday of what's called the Annunciation, the announcement to Mary by the angel Gabriel that she's going to become pregnant by the Holy Spirit and to bear a son and that he's to become the savior of the world. And Mary responds in a very interesting way. She simply says, I'm the Lord's servant. Let it be to me according to your will. That's a very good response. That's why Mary is considered one of the greatest people of faith ever because she understood that God's design was best for her life. And we need to understand the same. Wisdom is trusting God. Foolishness is trying to go our own way. And then finally in Luke 12, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? We need to focus not on the world, but upon honoring God. You know, years ago, and I've moved a total of 17 times in my life. Years ago, I used to acquire things. And it got to the point where on one particular move, we were going to need a second moving van. And that's when my wife said to me, you know, we need to stop acquiring and start divesting. And since that time, we've lightened our load. And each time we go from place to place, we leave more and more behind. Because actually, there's not a whole lot we need to be able to live life and enjoy it. And sometimes possessions have us rather than us having possessions. You know what I mean. So, you know, we need to focus on honoring God and his purposes, what he wants us to do with our lives, not on just acquiring stuff and more stuff and more stuff besides. And then <clears throat> this guy said, yeah, I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to store it all up and then I'm going to relax and I'll have self-sufficiency. I've I brought myself up by my own bootstraps. I grew this stuff, I harvested it, I'm storing it up. Well, not so much. You see, nothing that we have is really ours. It's all a gift from God. It's all part of his blessings. And so our attitude needs to be one of humble gratitude. Just simply say, thanks Lord for what I have 
but I release it to you. Use it in any way you see fit. I'm just trusting that you'll take care of me regardless. And you know what? God has a way of doing exactly that. Well, let's see if we can apply these ancient writings to our lives today. A lot of people say to me, you know, the Bible's out of date. The Bible's really been surpassed a long time ago. I don't know about that. I mean, there was a computer in the Garden of Eden. Granted, it was a rudimentary apple, and it only had two bytes of memory, and after that, everything crashed. But then a little later, by the time of Moses, things had gotten better. I mean, Moses was really the first internet technologist. He had two tablets that connected to the cloud. Yes, I'm a fool, a fool for Jesus. But let's apply these writings to our lives today. First of all, Christians, I got to say, lighten up. Please, lighten up. Quit making no the focus of Christianity. You know, no fun, no sex, no gambling, no drinking, no this, no that, no the other. You know, it's not where we are. Let's focus on the yeses. We say yes to love, yes to joy, yes to peace, yes to patience, yes to kindness, yes to all the gifts of God's Holy Spirit. And we express those in our lives and in our interactions with others in such a way that they say, hmm, that's a pretty interesting way of living. I might want to try it myself. And as you do that, focus on the positive. Again, the yeses rather than the noes. John Wesley, and I'm sure most of you who are listening to this know who he was. He was one of the great founders in Christianity of our particular branch of the church, the uh, Wesleyan or Methodist way. But uh, John Wesley, I can't quote it word for word, but uh, he said this, do all the good you can in all the ways you can for as long as you possibly can. And that's exactly what we need to do. Yes, there's a lot of negativity out there these days. We're worried about the war in Ukraine. We're worried about the Russians and the threat that they pose to peace throughout the world. We're worried about COVID and what's next in that regard. We're worried about our friends, our neighbors, our relatives, ourselves. So much that, that we've got to kind of juggle to stay afloat but really there's a lot of positive out there. I'm always impressed when I see the news where, you know, somebody's raised money for a good cause, whether it be for Ukraine or for the homeless or for um, just making it a better world. Um, I happen to be a Rotarian and our Rotary has been trying now for 30 years to eradicate the disease of polio We've almost succeeded. We're this close to removing polio permanently from our world so that never again would another human being be incapacitated and crippled by that virus. That's something good. I'm glad to be doing it. Find something good. Focus on all that's positive and do it, folks. Do it. And then finally, just again to say, really trust God. Really trust God. Don't just say that you trust God. Earlier today in the in-person worship service, we sang an old familiar hymn. It says, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. And I thought, yeah, we sing that, but a lot of us really say, some to Jesus I surrender. Some to him I'm willing to give. Well, when you close Jesus off from a particular part of your life and your relationships therein, he can't really work with you. You know, you can't just wall it off and say, 
This is Jesus' time. One Sunday morning, one hour, whatever it may take. And the rest of it's my time. And Jesus, don't you dare get involved in that. Well, not the way. Trust God. Trust God with all your time, your talent, your treasure, your life. And folks, if you're breathing, God has a purpose for you in this life, a good purpose. So trust him and he'll show you the way. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you are in fact the God of our fathers, the God of our world, and the God of ourselves. And Lord, help us to let you really be God. Let's not be fools in a worldly sense, but let us be fools for you, for you and for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that Mary understood very early what that meant, to let your will be done in her life Lord, may we let your will be done in our lives. May we do it in a way that's positive. May we do it in a way that's uplifting. And Lord, thank you again, despite all the problems and troubles in our world today, that yours is the victory. And we believe that. We believe that Jesus wins. We believe that ultimately he's coming back and he's going to restore this world and to claim his people for himself. We trust you, and we want to be a part of that good work that you're doing on this earth today.